pleased to, uh, to introduce to you our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Seng Yaolao, who is a Senior Executive Vice President at Tencent. Uh, this is very scary because if my, my high school teacher in statistics would know that I'm here standing to talk to you about statistics, she'll probably flip. <laughs> Now, uh, it's such a great honor for my team and myself to be here today at the IMF and to be given that opportunity to address you on the topic regarding digital economy in China. Let me begin by saying that judging from the, the distinguished profiles of the speakers that we have seen this morning, our presence here is actually rather unorthodox, wouldn't you think? Because if you were to look at this, I mean, this is a heavy, super heavy weight uh, global economics and statisticians, I can't even pronounce it correctly, uh, forum. And honestly, what do we know about statistics and what honestly do we know about economies uh, to be given such an honour to address such a distinguished uh, forum of ladies and gentlemen? Then my colleagues were trying to make me feel more easy by saying, that, you know what, you know, I think that's the reason why they put us after lunch. Because right after lunch, we could then talk about something lightweight for consumption, <laughs> digital or not. Well, anyway, I promise you that uh, that would be that's that that's all that I have in terms of jokes uh, for this session, uh, because when people <laughs> talk about China, uh, basically is 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 not something that's uh, to be taken lightly. Now, I'd like to begin by saying that uh, China's contribution towards the the entire global economy has grown more than five times over the past two decades. And you are all economics by, by profession, and uh, it, it then means that I don't really have to go right into the details. However, I do want to actually uh, put forward an idea for your kind consideration that this stunning growth has to do with the remarkable and historic digital transformation that modern China has achieved over the past two decades. And I'm eager to share with you on how that various layers of economic value system were transformed virtually, literally overnight between the interplays of the invisible hands of the government, obviously with the visible hands of the marketplaces. You know, sometimes you don't know which is which, you know, the government is visible or the marketplace is invisible. Now, I think more importantly, uh, my team and I, we are here to actually try to learn something from you on how digitalizations of a nation's economy could actually have an impact on the future role of GDP. From what we have learned from this morning, obviously there's a lot of discussions about whether such concept um, should continue. I think it would be uh, serving as a leading economic, economic uh, indicator and potentially it might be a chance that this concept could be migrating into some other possibilities as well. And we are privileged certainly to be part of this a distinguished forum uh, trying to explore towards a more intellectual foundation uh, going forward. Now, China today, to many people indeed, is actually the best in class uh, case study on how digitalization has made a positive impact on almost all social economic uh, layers within the society. And, and in fact, some of our friends that works as a, a, a professors and all that have actually said that this is actually a dream outcome for many economic uh, policy makers. You can see from this chart that China now is a global leader in e-commerce and digital payments and also in fact home to some of the largest um, so-called unicorns uh, that was actually homegrown or homebred from China. Granted, some critics have actually uh, voiced concerns that having achieved such a high growth, uh, numbers alone might not be adequate for China to continuously to sustain that sort of a fertile uh, digital transformation. Well, numbers certainly does actually speak the results as the portions of the GDP contribution flowing from the digital portion is now 30.3%. And that seems to be the highest growth rate in the world. Now, I know that you are statisticians. I know that when we talk about numbers, you get very excited. Like, like what we have learned from our previous speaker this morning, 
The best way to spend our time this afternoon might be actually for us to focus on discussion on getting the conceptual issues right for the time being. Now, with regards back to the digital economy in China, we believe that the true values of digital economy lies in the potential and inherent social economic impact that it will bring upon human race as a whole. And more importantly, this actually underscore the fact that the world that we're living in today is facing the dawning age of a new digital renaissance as a new digital civilization is about to begin. It also means that there are so many, so many other aspects of digital transformation that have yet to be studied and fully understood and of that social economy. And in fact, some of us this morning were saying that the conversation has actually just begun. Now, before I move on to the, the meat of the story, uh, perhaps let's quickly do a quick uh, update about how definitions of digital economy is being understood way back in China. Now, one of the most credible acknowledgements of that definition in China was actually found during the, the, the G20 summit in Hangzhou last year. As a very, very uh, simplistic glance, you can see that modern information network has become an important space for economic activities and information and communication technology has become a vital driver to optimize economic structures and both in terms of economic growth as well. Now that probably is the most remarkable features of China's digital economy. When we look at the digital components of the GDP, it's actually being divided further into two very distinct but interrelated components. The very first is a digital, the so-called information and communication technology ICT portion. And obviously the second one is this what we call the newly created integrated components. Now, the ICD portion refers to the tech sectors, including information technology, telecommunications, and the internet sector, whereas the integrated component refers to other industry. What is amazing is that more than 76% of the total digital economy today has been contributed by the integrated portion of the society. And what does this tell us? Just our founder, uh, Mr. Pony Ma, has said before that no pure internet enterprises will exist in a future society and all traditional industries and enterprises will have the genetic codes of the internet. And in fact, the border between digital economy and the real economy will eventually vanish at last. And uh, this means in China, the concepts of digital economy is just a transition in nature and eventually we believe that digital economy will just become simply the economy. Perhaps the next question that we, we ought to be engaging ourselves with would be how did a GDP size of 11 trillion in size actually manage to transform so rapidly within the space of the last two decades? In our opinion, this is simply an amazing story about how a nation's resolve and ability to digitalize economics activities across major industry sectors throughout the entire society. Now, in order for this to take place, two very fundamental things ought to be in place. The very first being a digital infrastructure and secondly, a very massive user adoption rate. And these two ingredients respectively actually made up, so happen, the demand and the supply sides of the equation. And by fortune and design, our company, many other companies in China for that matter, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, JD.com, TT, and etc., uh, we happen to be around and in, uh, were involved in both sides of that equation. Now, if we were to analyze from the supply sides of the economy, the government, along with all the business leaders, sectors, is actually building an increasingly sophisticated digital infrastructure in China. The Chinese government in China is not just a policy maker, but also an investor, a heavy investor, innovator, and a consumer themselves in that effort to promote the process, the, the so-called the, the, uh, adoption rates of digitalization. Now, it has actually advanced a number of policies and programs designed to strengthen the entire infrastructures of digital economy 
and making the most powerful engine, catalyst for economic growth over the years. And in fact, the most significant of all was the concept to be known as Internet Plus, unveiled back in the year 2015, and that followed up with a detailed action plans and a series of policies around the entire country. And we believe this is where the tipping points of various social economic impact begin. And I wish I, we probably have more time later on. Uh, I'm going to come back again uh, during tomorrow for the ending session, and we can talk more about this. Well, at the same time, the rapid emergence and the growth of the entire Chinese tech sector, the tech companies, are actually making China a pretty interesting ecosystem, if you like. So internet companies with global reach are creating a multi-faceted and multi-industry digital ecosystem. And, and these are some of the names that I, I've actually mentioned. And uh, in, in fact, you, you realize that most of the names here are beginning to appear in the so-called rankings of global brands, if you like. Uh, back to Tencent, our corporate strategies of connecting everything and empowering everyone has been a great source of enrichment uh, to the digital economy as we unleash the hidden powers of social connectivity. And our social network platform today now is actually the largest in China, along with our pioneering entertainment platform, cloud computing and mobile payment platform that is uh, being, uh, taking a larger share in market as well. And we are building a smart connecting ecosystem that anchors a multiple smart city lifestyles, if you like. So when a digital infrastructure is in place, the result is the unleashed of multiple pent-up demands. Uh, yesterday, we were, we were speaking to the, 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 the uh, Deputy Managing Directors of IMF, so we were trying to figure out whether such demand was new, it was whether it's from zero to one and one to n. I guess such questions will, will, will remain uh, to be deliberated uh, in this conference for these two days. One should never neglect the fact that China today um, has become the world's largest uh, mobile market. We have more than 50% of the, the Chinese population are actually utilizing mobile access. And that's a very powerful infrastructure that we have built over the years. Now, the huge network effect underlying user demand in this marketplace has led to a, a new types of uh, varieties of innovations, thereby pushing China's transformation from a trend follower uh, into a global trend setter and some of the things that we have seen uh, over the years. Today, China has a world-class digital investment and startup ecosystem, especially in key technologies areas uh, such as bike sharing, uh, cashless lifestyles, fintech, drone, just to name a few, and these are just the beginning. For this part of the sharing session, I think the point that we're trying to make is that it's clear that drivers from both sides of the economy have actually worked together to build a remarkable digitally imprint economy uh, to build this so-called uh, uniquely Chinese characteristics uh, playground, if you like. There's a song that in America that we used to sing, we built these cities with rock and rolls, right? That I think we can all relate to that. We are not that distant in terms of our age group. But in China, the guys there, they don't sing that way. They say, we built these cities with one and zeros. You know? <laughs> Let's see a video. Yeah.
We built these cities with one and zeros in it, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as we analyze the various drivers and the tipping points of that mega trends that is actually taking place in China today, it is amazingly similar to what we have learned from these notions of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, however, it's crucial to note that the real values of digital economy, and this is important, lies not in finding the new measurements of this economic model, but actually more importantly, appreciating the potentials that are hidden from social economic perspective. If, if there was one key word that I wish you would take away, uh, the reason that they deserve us flying thousands of miles away is actually this. It's not just about measurement, but the social economic impact that could have actually done within the society. Now, the way we look at it, this is not just another industrial revolution, but rather a potential upgrade to another level types of civilization. It is the logical next iterations of a previous combinations of the civilization that we have seen. Whether it was the stone stool civilization, the agricultural civilization, or the industrial civilization. The stage is now, and in fact the time is right. Um, that's what we are witnessing in China today. The time is right for the advent of a new enlightenment to be driven by digitalization and combined by intellectualization. That digital civilization is indeed a new chapter in a global development. If industrial civilization realizes mass production, the digital civilization will unleash personalized individual potential beyond just the concepts of productivity. Industrial civilization strives for higher speed for growth, while digital civilization advocates more balance and high quality development. Industrial civilization is the miracles of human concurring, knowing the world, and digital civilization has opened a new chapter in which mankind and nature and better still, artificial intelligence could all form together in what we call a community of a common destiny. So let's get back to the themes of this forum. How do we then measure this thing called digital economy? Allow me to share some of our point of views uh, on how GDP fits into that bigger picture of digital civilization. And do bear in mind that we are no economists and statisticians, but we do speak from a point of view of technology uh, evangelists or passionate about technology. The very first point that perhaps we would like you to consider would be this. The eras of digital civilization would only magnify further the consequences of GDP paradox. And here, I'd like to quote one of your colleagues, Dr. Lorenzo Ferramonte, a renowned economist from South Africa. And I quote, GDP is a powerful institution that shapes the way in which society sees value while molding the expectations and behaviors of politicians, business leaders, and people at large. The flaws of these numbers have been discussed at length since its invention and yet, the power remains unchallenged." End of quote. I think the paradox of GDP has been around for a, perhaps a little bit way too long, and through the histories of social science, there's not a single social paradox that appears to be so big as a subject to GDP. Now, as we enter into this, what we call digital civilization, with the availabilities of abundance of big data, cloud computing, not to mention the potentials of artificial intelligence and what we have learned this morning about blockchain. Think about how this entire digitalization will then magnify the consequences of a GDP paradox that we have created for ourselves. All of us here present today in this room, we have a decision to make and the ability to alter, at least alter that destiny that has been around for that far too long. Secondly, GDP should not be just a benchmark of the past, but it has to be a compass into the future. GDP has acted as an economic lighthouse for industrial civilization since the last century, back in the 1930s. But as it enters the, the eras of digital civilization, all challenges begin to surface. The growth drivers for economic development are going through profound changes in the transformation from industry to digital intelligence. We certainly need a compass that can reflect the contributions from that new industry, 
the creations of new economic forms and the energies of new models of production to further encourage and boost creativity from human race. And finally, GDP is not just a single index of growth, but it has to be an integration of hope. The digital civilization is a new step forward towards self actualization for the human being. The visions of a higher order of development based on celebrations of innovation, respect for environmentally friendly initiatives, and an open mindedness mindset for greater good that brings with it a sense of well being for all is gaining an increasing public support. Me, no economy, me, know nothing about this well being, GDPs, and all that. You guys figure it out. But I think the world that we're living in today, numbers is just not about growth. Now, that's exactly the directions that, in fact, back in China, the government was actually trying to follow, even way back in the year 2013. In 2013, the government was already emphasizing that China should not be looking forward in choosing our heroes based on just economic performance. Improvements in daily lives, social progresses, environmental protections and other indicators are all that had to be taken into account. Have we done the best we could? Probably not. But are we not losing the focus? Yes, I think we are just journeying on to look at beyond just growth from economy. The achievement of a more comprehensive, higher quality and sustainable development has been a shared goal of people around the world within the international community. Now, the popularization of big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence and especially blockchain has provided us with the possibility to construct a multi-dimensional data information cluster and the future guiding principle for such, such so-called innovations might even be a real-time data provided by machine intelligence. So if I may conclude, improving the well-being of people has been the original intention and the single ultimate purpose of the human economic activities. However, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be from the growth of statistics, and it certainly doesn't have to be the success of a very elite minority or from any short-term focus development. It has to flow from a daily focus on daily well-being, benefits that touches us all, the, the greater good and the vision for a long-term prosperity. As we are not far from the White House, if you may, if I may, allow me to use a quote from Abraham Lincoln in a bit of a non-traditional way. We should build a GDP measurement that is by the people, of the people, and for the people. <laughs> well, this aspiration is actually in line with the spirits of the Chinese government when we have this thing we call Wei Renming Fu, Wei Renming Mo Xin Fu, literally means for the prosperity of the people. Let me share with you with a real case study that we have done on how the power of digital innovation, digital economy has helped transform and raise the standard of living and even hope in a village that is actually thousands of miles away from any city in China. Tongguan is unenlightened and poor. Due to the impact of China's market economy, the younger generation has to migrate to urban areas to earn a living. The dramatic changes in family structure come in the way of local economic development, not to mention inefficient communication, lack of information, cultural loss, and the deepening of the digital divide. <laughs> Quite 
，哎，迈步出去就白干嘛。我们侗族的语言是不能用文字表达的。我和我老公谈恋爱的时候，就是以歌传的情，唱的什么歌，那就不能告诉你啦。<笑>现在的年轻人嘛，不用唱歌谈恋爱了。On November twelfth, twenty fourteen. Tencent Charity Foundation landed its We Country program in Tongguan, connecting the remote village with the internet. Nearly 100 villagers receive smartphones for free, signaling the era of rural internet all set to take off here. The elderly people and children left behind can communicate with their loved ones in a real-time manner. 远门轮、大门板、后博物馆、盖山、后博物馆、盖山。Village dynamics can be disseminated in a much more extensive and efficient way. Agro products are exposed to a much broader market. The endangered Kegel lynx also finds its way of inheritance. 